This is a Chronicle podcast. This is the history of the greatest of all man made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. By those who could pay and those who could no longer meet. The Price of Empire. Welcome to Chronicle's History Making Podcast, where we go behind the scenes of what it takes to make history documentaries. My name is Dan Jobson, director and filmmaker, and I'm here again with Michael Cove. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you. So today we arrive at the end of the war and the end of the series, The Price of Empire. The final two episodes cover the end of the war in Europe and the final milestones of the war in the Pacific, culminating in the atomic bomb and the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. Now, we briefly touched on, in the last episode, Eisenhower drawing his line of where the uh, Allies would advance to. But you say in this episode that both Eisenhower and Stalin told each other that Berlin was not their target. But there was also very clearly a race going on between the three armies of the Red Army to get to Berlin. So why were the two leaders, was it all just bluster to sort of put Churchill in his place and show that his influence was waning? I don't think it was bluster. I think it was a calculated con job. Stalin told Eisenhower and the Americans what they wanted to hear and they believed him. And after the war, Eisenhower admitted that he'd made a mistake And the one thing that he said he would do differently if he had his time over again was go for Berlin. Right. So it can only be assumed that if, I mean, if with hindsight he said that, then it must be assumed that he believed that had he set for Berlin, he would have been able to get there. So any argument to suggest that his forces were inadequate or were you know, I- incorrectly located or whatever doesn't really stand up against what he himself said after the war. So it must be assumed that he believed the undertaking that uh, Stalin made and also that he believed along with the American administration that the post-war settlement of Europe would be equitable which I think Churchill never believed that. And no. Churchill never believed that a Europe divided between liberal democracies on the one hand and communists on the other was ever going to be a comfortable place. And that's pretty much what he said in his Iron Curtain speech. You've got some absolutely incredible Soviet eyewitnesses in these in this last episode who were there during the Battle of Berlin. And one of the, the things that I took away that I found really interesting was the comment that after the battle, or even once the battle seemed like they had won, that the city was transformed into white with people hanging bedsheets and pillowcases and anything they could find out of their window. What was it like talking to these direct eyewitnesses about that? They were surprisingly, I suppose, what should I say, matter of fact about that part of the war. They, they could get fairly um, emotional and, and they could get fairly upbeat about some of the other experiences that they had had. But I think by the time they got to Berlin and the war was won, which is what that sort of a sudden exposure of, of all of these white flags meant to them that they had won. I think there's this inevitable feeling of letdown in a way. Their, their job was done and all they wanted really was to go home. Mm. But I think also that part of the story, they were perhaps guarded because they know the reputation that their army and therefore by association they themselves uh, have for their conduct during those final 
uh, months of the war, weeks mm. and months of the war. Certainly it wasn't a triumphalist sort of mood when they talked about the final stages. The final stages. Mm. Well, there's one comment in there which I think really sums it up for me for the British attitude. It's Roy Dixon says, oh, thank God it's over. Mm. It's interesting because Roy Dixon says that, but then Roy Dixon didn't get out of the army and he ended his military career as a general. Uh, so, wow. <laughs> so, so so it certainly it, wasn't quite over for him. No, no, he ended up as something, uh, you know, as a general in the British Army and associated with NATO High Command. So, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting that you know, he bre- breathes a sigh of relief and then thinks, well, now what will I do? Oh, I may as well stay where I am. <laughs> and go right yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. After VE Day, fighting obviously still continued in, in the Pacific theatres and obviously the, the battles got increasingly bloody and increasingly uh, hard fought. One of the things that I wasn't aware of before watching The Price of Empire was your story about the kamikaze, not the pilots, but the soldiers who swam at the landing ships mm. with bombs on their head. Yep. Now, that's that's just incredible to me. So I've never read that anywhere. Um, so that was Joe Ruggiero? That's right. Yeah. So Joe was a wonderful guy. So Joe I met in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. He was in the Navy. And he walked in, and they told me, oh, you know, this veteran coming to, you know, this guy walked in, I ignored him. And he walked up to me and said, I am Joel. And I thought, I'm being conned. I swear to God, the guy was 92. You wouldn't have put him a day over 70. He looks incredibly Doesn't young. He? In the, Doesn't yeah. he? Amazing. But he was 92. And he told that story. And he, I mean, Joe told about being with the torch landings Mm -hmm. in North Africa, then D-Day, then Okinawa. (laughs) So he went went around and saw many of the key battles. And uh, just because it's, I like it, I said to him, what happened after the war, Joe? So he was from Brooklyn, but he'd never been on a ship, right? Mm -hmm. And he got put in the Navy, and that was his war. And he came back, and I said, what did you do after the war? He said, well, you know, he'd really enjoyed it so much that when he got demobbed, he got a job on the Staten Island Ferry. And that's what he did for the rest of his working life, just chugged up and down on the Staten Island Ferry, and he loved it. And that was Joe. But yeah, he tells the story that what they had to do was stand at the rails of their ship with with small arms because these Japanese with bombs strapped to their heads would come swimming towards the ship to try and impact the hull of the ship. And they tried to shoot them before they got there. So it's a form of kamikaze, which I haven't read or heard about anywhere else. One of the other American eyewitnesses, Nicholas Mara, he has a very emotional moment talking about the kamikaze he was on the on the ships firing at the planes and he gets to a really powerful moment where he says that later in life he's come to forgive them because he realized they were just doing their job yeah his words exact words were well first of all he he apologized because he got very emotional and his words when he apologized were wonderful he said i i got to apologize for this i'm usually a happy go lucky guy <laughs> And then he told the story, and that's one of the moments, and I don't think I am misleading myself when I say this, one of those moments, and there were a few during the production of the program, where you feel sure that you're being told a story that this person has never told before. Wow. And the story that he told, and again, I I met him in Brooklyn, which of course is the home of the Brooklyn Naval Dockyard. I met him in Brooklyn. He was on a some sort of a submarine support vessel, so part of the um, screen mm-hmm. of the, the fleet. And they were hit by kamikaze. And he went forward to the bridge, which is where the plane impacted. And he saw the pilot and he said that the pilot was wrapped in his parachute and he could never understand that. Why did he have a parachute? But he did. And he looked at him. He was obviously dead. And he said, and I think his words, I paraphrase slightly because of my faulty memory, but they were too effectively to say, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I got to say he had a job to do and he did a good job. So that was 
the moment that uh, made made him tear up a bit. And he was a great old chap, and uh, that was his war. And yeah, that was the moment where I think he saw that uh, the person who had been trying to kill him was a young bloke like him. After these bloody battles in, in the Pacific, it then obviously culminated in what Truman described as the greatest thing in history ever, the dropping of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. Now, you interviewed a survivor of Hiroshima, Professor Kenji Kitagawa. What was it like interviewing him? So, yeah, Kenji Kitagawa was, um, at that time, he was one of the people who spoke in Hiroshima and delivered talks to people to explain all. He was an academic, as a professor, as you say. But but so he was he was quite rehearsed. I, I don't mean that in a in an, in any sense of pejorative way, but he was quite re- rehearsed in in his he narrative. He told his story many times, and, and, uh, and he he pretty much told the narrative. And it's a very powerful narrative, of course, because he was in his classroom at school, and there was this God Almighty flash, <laughs> and uh, and then he tried had to try and and make his way home, and his home was on the other side of the river, and the river was on fire. So it's a very powerful story. Mm. But it's a story that it was not one that had it. It has the authenticity of lived experience, but not the sort of spontaneity of someone who's, who's recalling like, something like we that... just said of Nick actually opening something that has been sealed mm. for decades because it was a moment that you didn't want to revisit. And you get that rawness and and honesty. Mm. So, yeah, it was, I think, two things about it, really. Uh, One is that he, because he was a victim, he didn't have the sort of perspective on the Hiroshima blast that I think people in Japan had at the time. That that, that was because, when I say that, at the time, people didn't really understand what had happened. No. A bloody big bomb went off, and it destroyed a lot of people, but it actually did less damage than the firebombing of Tokyo. To me, I think that people need to bear that in mind when they are determining whether or not the bomb was really central to the Japanese decision to seek to, to surrender, to seek peace terms. Well, I think that's that's a, a really important point because directly after Hiroshima, Truman and the United States didn't hear any response from Japan it, towards the Potsdam Declaration. So they, of course, then set off the second bomb in, in Nagasaki. But it was really the invasion of Manchuria by the Soviets that really was what forced their hand. Am I correct in saying I that? I think that's absolutely right, yes. I, I, I think that the invasion, so you have, what, three incursions, so not three Soviet armies, more than that, but they're coming in three directions. So there's one coming uh, in, in from the north and from the east and one coming up from the south, and they smash into Manchuria and they obliterate any attempt at opposition. There's no doubt that if the war goes on, two things will happen. One is that the entire Japanese presence in Manchuria and possibly in China will be wiped out. And that presence includes an enormous infrastructure investment that has been made since the Japanese occupation of Manchuria in 1931. So that's nearly 15 years years. that they've been, in quotes, colonizing that part of China. And that'll all go. And they'll lose that. And they'll lose any possibility of negotiating for some sort of settlement where that's concerned. And so I think it seems incomprehensible to me that anybody in Japan, there was a military faction which did, but it it, it really wasn't going to be sustained that anybody could look at what was happening in terms of what was happening to the overseas Japanese empire and say, well, we'll go on fighting. What would be the point of mm. that? So there were people talking about, you know, the, the suicide of a million and all of this stuff and training people how to use bamboo spears, but on it's all beaches, a nonsense. Yeah. It's all a nonsense. There's no doubt that, uh, to me, it, it was the invasion of Manchuria which demonstrated clearly that not only was it all up, the end had come, but that not to acknowledge that at this point would seriously 
risk the possibility of the Japanese empire as it stood, and, mm-hmm. I, and I mean the, the home islands, just ceasing to exist. They would have no possibility of, uh, if, if the Soviets kept coming, mm-hmm. they would be crossing, I mean, yeah, let's keep fighting until the Red Army lands in Japan. In Japan. With the Americans coming up from Okinawa in the south, and they'll be coming across the straits. I mean, well, it would have been what some extremists in the radical military faction wanted, right. which is, which is, you know, national suicide. National we'll all suicide, die. Which... We'll all die. Right. You you point out the statistic after they do finally surrender and they sign the uh, the Potsdam Agreement and the Emperor comes over the radio, which for everyone is the first time they've ever heard the emperor's voice. Some didn't even know it was the emperor. They they came back on after and explained what, what he had just said. But that you point out that 96% of the population believed that what they just heard meant that now they were going to die or be starved. Yeah, so so the first the first thing to say is that, that the emperor's statement called the imperial rescript was uh, broadcast before they signed anything it was telling them that they had to basically and you're right after he had finished speaking and and everybody uh, had to stand as so they they put loudspeakers around the place as, as well as people having radios and everybody had to stand whilst he delivered this uh, address but he delivered it in in the courtly language the formal language of the imperial the, the peacock throne, whatever it is, chrysanthemum throne, I should say. And uh, afterwards, the announcer came back on and explained to people what they'd just heard. Because because mainly because the emperor didn't actually say the war is over and we, we're going to surrender. He said, oh, we're going to have to, the emperor said, we're going to have to endure the unendurable. And uh, what did all that mean? Nobody really understood. So they came back on and said, the emperor has just announced, you know, what he said is that we're, we're, we're giving up and the war's over. The panic that must have gripped people because of the way in which a war long propaganda campaign had persuaded them that the white devils, these mm-hmm. Anglo-Saxon devils, these white devils, were going to uh, just just like locusts across the land. And after the war, yeah, after the war, 4% you know, were, uh, we'll be okay. We'll be all right. <laughs> 96% <laughs> were just, well, we'll just wait and they'll come and they'll and you know, all over. rape our women and take our children. And it'll be awful. Um, so that's what they believed. But in a way, you can understand that, that because that's the, the, the sort of drift of propaganda and the, 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 the more problematic the war the stronger that propaganda has mm. to be to keep people fighting. And to go back to the the fall of Berlin and the white flags, I mean, that's why people were hanging out their bedsheets because they absolutely were persuaded that, the, you know, the, the barbarians were at the gate. Mm. And our days are numbered. They, they, they had cause, and in the case of the uh, population of, of Berlin, one of the reasons that they could believe that is that they knew that the invading army would be vengeful. Right. I don't think that was a issue for the Japanese population. They just didn't comprehend it in those terms. Mm. When they get here, they're going to tear us over. apart. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of the war. One of the, the staggering numbers that ends the price of empire, which really does account for what the price of empire is, is that the death ratios. Now, obviously, this can't be officially counted in any way, but for every two US deaths, there were three British and Commonwealth deaths. There were 12 for the Japanese, 22 for the Germans, but 184 for the Soviets. Now, that is just absolutely staggering of, of that loss of life for the Soviets and the fact that they were able to, to continue on and I think it's often misinterpreted or not even not even really realised how much the Soviets suffered in this time. Yeah, if I can say something which might sort of put a, put a time stamp on our conversation. So just bear that in mind and note also that every single... And what were there, 15 or something like that? Every single Russian veteran to whom I spoke either had his medals on 
or had his uniform and his medals on. Right. Right? And they could do that and do that in public. I'm not talking about people who, who sort of put something on because a camera was coming to their home. They wear those things in public. That's a source of pride. A source of pride and a certainty that it is going to be respected. No one's going to laugh. No one's going to mock. Everybody's going to understand that person. Look at the age. They must be a veteran of the great patriotic war, and we will respect them for that. Why? Because it was such an awful and appalling experience for all of us. Look at how many of us were killed. Mm. And we won. Despite it all, we won. And if you don't understand that that is absolutely hardwired into everything Russian, it's in the Russian educational system, it's in Russian movies, and it's in Vladimir Putin's brain. If you don't understand that, you, you can't understand how their policies operate. Even when their policies are utterly objectionable, totally unforgivable, you, you, you have to understand that that's at the background of everything. The core of their it's culture. It's at the background of their sense of isolation. I mean, that, why did Stalin go on and on about opening a second front? Because they felt, rightly or wrongly, that they were having to do it all on their own. Unless you look at a map and see how much of the Soviet Union, which is to say a fair bit of Russia, all of Ukraine, all of the Baltic republics, all of Belarus, as they now are on the map, were occupied by German forces for years. They were occupied for years and their populations were abused in all sorts of ways for years. And that death count is not one for 183 in combat. That's, That's how many citizens, life. including including civilians, but predominantly civilians, were victims of the occupation regime. So unless you understand that, really, you're not in a position to understand the, the psyche the, of, the, of yeah. the current. And, and can I just say, because it's missed out from that, but the same is true of China, because there were, I think, 27 million Soviet dead. And nobody knows how many Chinese, but certainly not less than 20 million. From 1931 until 1941, they were fighting on their own. Mm. And OK, it all, you know, it went, as they say, pear-shaped at the end and they had a civil war and then the communists took over. But they are obsessed with the war against Japan. They make movies and television shows all the time about the war against Japan and about how they had to do it all on their own. And it, I mean, it's very often distorted because, it, you know, they want to make it pro propaganda for the Chinese Communist Party and they don't want to play up the role of the, the Kuomintang and all of that. But at the most basic level... It's the, it's the defining moment in modern China. It's the moment that separates what the Chinese call a hundred years of humiliation right. from the relics of imperial China to modern new China, as Chinese people call it, new China. New China. So you don't understand the way in which the Second World War in China Absolutely appears in their imagination and in their history and in their memory. Then you don't understand their worldview either. No. It's really important to understand what this war meant to those countries and means to those countries in terms of their historiography, if you like, if you're going to have any chance of understanding their worldview. Speaking of that viewpoint on war, the, the last eyewitness we hear from in the series is Clifford Everton from South Africa. And his final comment is that individual fighting, bayonets, hand grenades, that is war, that is war. And then he breaks down, and it's mm. incredibly powerful. Now, you've told us about how you worked out the first line for the series, and that was somewhat of the floodgates to, to writing it. How did you discover your final line? Can I just tell you something about Cliff? Because Please. So, so I didn't put it in the program because it seemed to me too private a moment, and I 
the left Cliff's concluding statement, as you've just quoted it, as it is, and left out the last thing that he said. Not long after I made the programme uh, and finished it, I heard that Cliff had died, and I feel that I can perhaps uh, add the thing that he remembered, which remembering it really triggered the beginnings of the breakdown mm -hmm. that you've just referred to. And he then made this statement, and then by then he was a completely in, in tears. And uh, I went from my seat to him and sat with my arm around him for a while. Um, that's one of the moments where you feel confident that you've just heard something that he's never told anyone before. You've been a new shoulder. Yeah. So what he said was, that's war, that's war when some silly bastard pulls the pin out of a grenade and forgets to throw it and blows his own bloody head off. And you just knew that he was describing something that happened to a mate of his right next to him. He didn't need to ask. It was so obvious from the, the, the depths within him from which he was dredging up that memory. That's war. That is That's war. war. So the quote, what I, ca I honestly can't remember is where I first encountered that quote. Couldn't be more opposite. I, I mean, I, you know, some people might think, oh, he must have made that up because it fits so perfectly. For, and it's a quote from Tacitus, who was uh, one of the, well, he's regarded now, I suppose, as one of the preeminent historians at the time of. Uh, Rome's greatness. That's right, over 2,000 years yeah, ago. 2,000 years ago. And I can't remember verbatim. You've probably got it yeah, there, I so you can you. Could says... commit me. But, but basically what it said in terms of, of validating the or summarising the hypothesis of the series was that people plunder and pillage and what they plunder and pillage and misname empire. That's right. It says, those who could have been embraced as liberators were loathed as conquerors. They misnamed their conquests empire and they paid the price. Yeah, that's me. That's not Tacitus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's me, uh, I suppose, sort of, uh, what, what's, what's the word? Riffing on, on Tacitus. <laughs> and I think that's true of the story that we tell that uh, certainly, you know, there are, that is literally true because there are demonstrable occasions where both German and Japanese troops moved into a territory to be greeted as potential liberators and for quite simply racist reasons and no other mm -hmm. behaved quite differently, behaved as oppressors. Uh, behaved, as, uh, yeah, be, mm. uh, behaved as conquerors rather than liberators, and that's not the the reason why both those countries lost the war and lost the empires that they so rapidly uh, expanded into. But mm. it's one of the reasons. We said just earlier that Eisenhower, if he had another go at it, he would have aimed for Berlin. Now, in retrospect, these years later, looking back on the price of empire, is there anything? you would have done differently. Oh, there's always, yeah, I mean, there's always something you'd do differently. There's always a lot of things you'd do differently. I mean, you know, I, I'm constrained really in, in, in some respects because the, there, there are things that I, I would wish I would have had the opportunity to do differently, but then some of those things I wished at the time I could do differently and, <laughs> right. and I just couldn't. So I didn't have the budget. Um, for finding more veterans than I did, more mm -hmm. eyewitnesses than I did, going to more places than I did. And there are some, to me, obvious uh, gaps in, in the sort of first-person narrative um, because of that. Uh, there are also some gaps or inadequacies in the visual storytelling because of the limitations in terms of the archive, of the archive. that we could access and the cost of, of some archive that, that was just beyond uh, the scope of the production. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, the things that 
with hindsight, I could have done differently and would perhaps do differently now, even if I had the same uh, parameters. Well, as a writer, I mean, the first thing you, that you would say is, yeah, I'd write it different. Of course I would. <laughs> of course I would. Of course I can't see it without, well, God, what was he thinking? <laughs> what a... God, there must be a better way of putting it. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's one thing. It's really difficult. I don't know if it would work. So I have to preface this by saying, I don't know whether it would work, but I would explore alternatives to the strictly chronological narrative that the series follows. I think there are, I mean, it, it, it's obliged to depart from that chronology on rare occasions when you want to just get something of a story like the Battle of the Atlantic, just get it out of the way. You can't mm -hmm. keep coming back to it. Oh, six right. months later, six months later, this, this, and this. But the, the basic structure of the series is chronological, and that's predictable, and virtually every book that you read on the Second World War follows the same follows structure. The it's the same chronological telling of the story. I'm not sure that there isn't a better way. So I think there are alternatives to chronology, and I don't mean that in terms of, oh, let's try and be different, mm -hmm. just because there are lots of um, you know narratives that follow the course of the war, and, and they, many of them predate Price of Empire, and others have been made since, and that'll continue to happen, particularly since then. There's been more access to archive that has previously it's been closed mm -hmm. in the former Soviet Union, and I think that'll probably be happening in parts of Asia, including Japan, which has not been very forthcoming. So there's always reasons to revisit the story and tell it in the traditional way. But I, I think that it, it's interesting to look at what sorts of themes are embedded in history. I don't mm -hmm. know that the real richness of history comes from just giving a, a recitation story. of, you know, this is what happened and then this and then this. And well, so what? That's what happened then. What can you make of it? And, mm. and there are themes embedded in the Second World War, particularly, I suppose, that are worth exploring an, in a topical way, perhaps, rather than a chronological way, which I'm better equipped to do now than I was then because <laughs> of the work that I've done and the people I've spoken to and the books I've read. I, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring topics. I think one of the things about history is that people who are interested in history are interested in history. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's an audience. And necessarily, it's an audience which is going to, on television, find a lot of programming to do with the Second World War, the rise of the Nazis, the this, the mm -hmm. that, all of that period, that that sort of, I, I guess, if you like, the from from the beginning of the 1930s through to the end of the 1940s because mm -hmm. there's an awful lot of film and it's very easy. And yeah, it's got that classical story structure stuff. of yeah, good versus and bad. And... Good and bad, larger than life characters, all of that. So people are interested and they'll always be interested. And I, I was once asked to write uh, a paper for, for teachers of media. Mm-hmm. About, about making history documentaries. And, uh, of course, one of the challenges that we face is getting people to buy what we do. And my paper was entitled, Has It Got Hitler in the Title? <laughs> um, As in it will always sell. It'll, always, you... it'll always sell, exactly. So I, I think there are ways of challenging an audience that is interested but is not exactly coming fresh mm -hmm. to the material that you're dealing with. On that note, what's some advice you would have for any documentary makers out there currently that are setting forth or about to embark on making history? What advice would you give them? I would like to preface this by saying that I suspect that my advice is iconoclastic and you will find a considerable number of people who would tell you to ignore me. Your, your career will be greatly advantaged if you ignore me. But my advice is to remember a, a bon mot that belongs to the novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, you don't write because you want to say something. You write because you've got something to say. <laughs> 
So if someone says to you, Second World War or Hitler or whatever you like, I think you have to have your own reason, find your own reason for wanting to tell that story. And apart from anything else, the f story is so enormous. You'll never navigate your own way through it, even in a chronology, without having some reason to preference some, some things over others, emphasise some things more than others. People will disagree with you. That's inevitable. And people disagree with eminent historians and the books that they write. And that's inevitable too. But if you have something to say, the, then in my opinion, there is a, a possibility that people will find your work more engaging than if you are just saying something. There's a quote from the old advertiser, Bill Bernbach, which says along the lines of, have a viewpoint, because then people will either be for you or against you, but they can't ignore you. Well, I think that's what you want. I mean, you know, people who watch programs might actually say, well, no, that's not me. But I think, in a way, it is all of us. If you don't want to watch something, I'm going to sound like a real intellectual snob now, but I don't <laughs> care. If you, if you want to sit and watch something and not be challenged and not be made a bit angry by something or whatever, then, well, you watch Celebrity Come Dancing. <laughs> well, maybe that gets you going as well, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's relatively innocuous. <laughs> but if you're going to watch something about... I don't know, the, the, the barbarity of the Second World War and think that you can just sort of watch it and then when it's over go, oh, it's quite good, wasn't it? You fancy a cup of tea? Well, that's not the reaction I want. Well, on that, one final question for you, Michael. It's been absolutely great going through this series chronologically, but now just a step away from The Price of Empire, can you tell me who's a hero of yours? Hmm. Not readily. <laughs> Let me think for a moment. I mean, it's really hard. Um, see, I could name people who are heroes of mine, but they're not well known. They're people I've worked with whose names won't mean anything to people, but they were inspirational. I worked with a couple of directors, theatre directors. I started in my life as a professional writer, full-time writer, writing for the theatre. I worked with a couple of theatre directors in Sydney, who uh, both of whom we lost to AIDS. You, you, you think back over a long, in my case, ridiculously long career, and it's surprising how few people actually can see in three dimensions and in colour. There's plenty of figures there, you know, but, yeah. in, but in terms of life-size characters who still have a sort of living, breathing presence in your memory, there are very few. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard and Rex are both um, men like that for different reasons. They couldn't have been more different as directors, and I, I was blessed to work with both of them. So I, I remember people like that. I remember uh, I worked with an American producer, uh, Australians who are old enough will remember number 96. One of the producers of that soap opera was an American named Bill Harmon. I had a long working relationship with Bill before he suddenly took sick and almost as suddenly died of leukemia uh, right in the middle of our project. He, he just one of those people that you know even when you're working with him Whatever happens, you're never going to forget this guy. And, and the, the things you're learning from him and the confidence that he's giving you. So there are a few people like that who are heroes of mine. I, I must say, I don't have any heroes in the public space. There's none a particular there's no, faces there's from no history. There's no person. Or... I'm, I, I just don't think of people like that. I, I guess I see too many people, and, and sooner or later you think, yes, but. So, you know, yeah, there's good things to say about Gandhi, and there's good things to say about this person and that person, but would I regard that person as a hero? Would I regard that person, therefore, as some sort of a model? Well, 
One of the reasons that I don't is because you're just aware of your own inadequacies. What is the point of me modelling myself on Nelson Mandela? Yeah. It's absolutely pointless. So I think he was, a, you know, a, a great figure. But he's not a hero of mine because, you know, I, I can't lead my people out of the wilderness. I don't have any people. So, <laughs> you know. Well, I think that uh, it's a terrific answer. And I think that personal level is, is what actually is what makes a hero. It's been absolutely great over the last few weeks talking to you about Price of Empire. Thank you for all your time, all your insights, and of course, all of your knowledge. It's been my pleasure. I hope people find something of interest in it. And if anyone's out there and wants to watch The Price of Empire, it is of course available on Chronicle right now. This has been Dan Jobson, and you've been listening to Chronicle's History Making Podcast. You've been listening to a Chronicle Podcast. 